I've been talking at NICE for the last couple of years, and Murat has been graceful uh, to let me give some updates of our work. Um, so our work focuses mostly on exploiting emerging technologies like memristors in designing neuromorphic systems. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk mostly about how we use these uh, memoristive devices to scale up and build large-scale architectures, particularly for spatiotemporal processing applications. Um, a quick overview of neuromemoristive systems. I think earlier talk by Tarek covered a lot about the devices and the circuits. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick uh, high-level motivation on how we are uh, approaching in designing these systems. Um, we try to uh, take inspiration from the brain, I mean, and uh, build adaptive computing platforms. And particularly, the memristor devices are used to facilitate uh, efficient computation and learning. Um, the end goal is to have basically efficient natural processing tasks that are um, run on hardware platforms. So the focus of today's talk is on two specific architectures. First, I'll talk about the reservoir architecture that we've been uh, working on, both on a commodity FPGA and a neuromemoristive system. And the second is the HDM architecture, which was built using a neuromemoristive system and a commodity flash. Um, most of you probably already know about reservoir architectures here. Um, I think Dr. Maas just left, but um, uh, Wolfgang Maas and Eger are pioneers in uh, designing this reservoir computing framework. It is very efficient um, a recurrent network topology, particularly because the training process is very simple and it is very efficient to realize in hardware. Um, so early, in our earlier work, we looked at different topologies on how to uh, realize this reservoir. So we looked at uh, the basic ring topology, uh, which is easy to realize in hardware. Um, it has fewer number of synapses, and as you can see, the node-to-node -node connections is very uh, simple, but it also has very slow response, so it has high delay. Um, then we have been looking at other topologies which have center nodes and um, uh, other hybrid topologies but um, where the diameter is low and the average distance is uh, low. But um, there was a specific topology that directly maps the reservoir um, onto the hardware, and that's where we've started looking at the twisted toroidal network, where um, the reservoir can be exactly mapped onto this uh, toroidal structure. And uh, there is a lot of color coding here, uh, but you can see that uh, from the input to the reservoir nodes, we have a specific set of the toroidal connections, and uh, between the reservoir nodes, we have a different set of connections and so forth. And within each of these uh, nodes is what you can see uh, is the reservoir neuron, and you have those uh, synapses that are connected to the different uh, to, uh, to the other nodes or adjacent nodes. These are all implemented using memristors. So before we implemented this using a neuromemristive system, we first uh, implemented it on uh, two uh, reconfigurable platforms, FPGA Vertex 5 and Vertex, Vertex 6. Um, if you ask me why we implemented on those, because that, those were the platforms that were available for our lab at that time. Uh, but we are exploring other platforms right now. Um, and we did uh, analysis. This is like a, a simple neuronal design in the digital framework, but we just kind of compared the power consumption or utilization of the power on these different platforms. And it is very much guided by um, what the actual baseline platform is, as you can um, guess, because there is a lot of additional overhead on these systems that is really not required for these uh, architectures. Um, then we looked at the reservoir uh, or the neuromemristive system for the reservoir. Um, so before we actually implemented this, we took uh, a step back and said, well, we've been looking at um, um, synapses and uh, neuron designs using memristors for a while, but one of the things you could take advantage in a reservoir is that it has um, random initial weights that are distributed to the reservoir. So if there is a way we could use the process variations within the uh, hardware to kind of generate those random weights, then we could save significant uh, hardware overhead in designing the system. So we kind of designed a synapse uh, utilizing process variations, and based off of that, um, we actually built a, a, a simple crossbar structure uh, with the reservoir outputs. And then um, we did the um, circuit analysis, the Monte Carlo analysis of how these random weight distributions are. You could see that uh, how the random weights are distributed and how the random biases are associated within the synapse. And then we also compared what would be the advantage of using our proposed synapse over a baseline synapse, particularly in terms of area, because in the end we are trying to have an area and energy efficient system. 
Um, you could see that on the x-axis here for all these different uh, realizations, sorry, um, so, so for all those different distributions, um, uh, you could see how the area of the proposed synapse is pretty uh, uniform in there, but you could see as if you require weight, a lower weight resolution, then a baseline synapse is better than using um, uh, this proposed design. So we compared this with different data sets with EEG uh, and uh, EMG. I'm just showing the EMG data set results here. Um, um, so we had about 84% 84, 84 classification accuracy here. We are actually trying to look at the five fingers uh, movement and uh, we were able to get a pretty good uh, classification accuracy, similar, comparable to um, other uh, techniques that were used in, uh, for it within this data set. And we also did the power consumption analysis. Um, on the left is um, uh, the, how we estimated the power for each of the individual components and for the whole architecture, we kind of looked at as if, as the reservoir size is varying, how the power dissipation is changing and for what specific topology we have a um, uh, lower power. So the one way ring topology obviously has lower power com consumption compared to others. Um, but, uh, and the random obviously has the highest power consumption. And uh, right now we are looking at optimizing this and extending it into liquid state machines. Um, so the next uh, part of the talk is going to show some of the work we have been doing on the hierarchical temporal memory architectures. Um, so before we designed uh, an architecture or any hardware for this, it was really hard to uh, understand or how to design this in hardware. Um, I wish Jeff was here to listen to this, but uh, um, so uh, actually that team was very helpful in making us uh, understand this. So the first step for us was to have a, like a typical hardware engineer, we wanted to have like some kind of formalization for this design. So the first step we did was um, to actually formalize the spatial pooler and uh, this paper was recently published on archive if anybody is interested and all the uh, code is also open sourced out. Um, so the, um, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, HTM, there is uh, spatial pooling and the temporal pooling uh, components within the HTM. So uh, we started just first exploring the initial um, part, which is the spatial pooling, um, and we were able to formalize it. So the goal of this work was to exp explore what is the primary learning mechanism within the spatial pooler. So we kind of identified two distinct components, basically permanent selection and the degree of the permanence update. Um, and we use like a maximum likelihood estimator for determining the degree of permanence update. I don't want to go through um, all the math for this, but uh, I'll be happy to discuss with you offline about this uh, formalization. Um, and then we were uh, testing this initial test where, uh, with very simple uh, test cases like um, handwritten uh, digit learning. Uh, whether it's able to uh, recognize the digits accurately. And then we also did um, a simple analysis with predicting the alphabet, uh, given A, where was it able to predict B? I mean, whether it's able to predict the sequence efficiently. Um, so it was uh, working pretty well in that context uh, for both of those. And then, sorry. Um, so we've uh, taken two approaches in building just the spatial pooler component. So the first part was to build it using a neuromemorative system. Um, the figures are a little blurry, I apologize for that. Um, uh, on the top left is what we show, um, like how we are doing the different phases within the spatial pooler, like the overlap and the inhibition phase. And the inhibition phase itself, we used a winner take all circuit and uh, the memory strip synapse, the new memory strip uh, designs are used in this uh, overlap phase. And we tested this with, again, uh, early test results um, uh, using AR phase data set um, for basically sample phase recognition problem using different conditions like emotions, light conditions, and occlusions wearing glasses or scar scarves. Um, so depending on some of the complexities, you could see um, there is a deterioration in the accuracy, but Overall, I think it was in an 81%. So this data set has 100 classes and 2,600 facial images, um, if any of you are interested. Um, so the second approach was, okay, we are looking at this neuromemorative systems, but this is um, a long-term uh, trajectory. Is there a way we could use uh, existing um, or commodity um, systems to kind of uh, design these uh, architectures? So we were looking at, uh, in collaboration, uh, we were looking at uh, uh, particularly storage processing units because these have been modeled like 
to have 100 times lower power consumption and uh, compared to CPUs or GPUs for a wide range of applications. And these systems are there already. So um, what we did was we built off of this system uh, using uh, to implement basically a flash-based architecture. Um, uh, the details of this work will be published within a month, um, but this is like a high-level uh, bird's eye view of what we are trying to do. You could see uh, the model we are integrating has is very minimally invasive. Um, so my student named it Gray Matter Flash. I don't know if it is appropriate name, but uh, just to say that's the model uh, that will be um, uh, integrated within the system. Uh, basically. Um, so these devices can uh, exploit existing uh, interfaces within hyperscale data centers, and we did some analysis of the spatial pooler, how the different parameters within this uh, are uh, stabilized or affected. Um, so for example, on the left is the boosting. How is the boosting stability based on the uh, size of the network and uh, how much time it takes to actually simulate the overall network? And uh, we were able to, we just got, this is like, um, fresh results, like my student just sent this to me a couple of days back, but we got like 95, 99% accuracy for simple MNIST classification, and we are able to, we are just uh, getting the power results for this. Uh, so um, I would like to thank all my students who have been working hard uh, in getting these large scale uh, designs, and, uh, and thank my collaborators for helping us um, doing some exciting work. Thank you. Thank you. So this SSD implementation, is this on a real piece of hardware or is it a simulation? Uh, so right now, uh, so we started off with transaction level modeling and then uh, we did uh, RTL, VHDL modeling, so, um, and synthesis. So it's not actually put on a system yet. Are you planning to do so? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Yes. I have uh, two questions concerning your uh, liquid state machine implementation. So first of all, you mentioned that uh, you'd like to have some diversity in your liquid, for which I believe that memristors are pretty good. Um, the question is, how, how did you um, do the training of the weights from the liquid to the readout with memristors? Uh, so uh, I just wanted to clarify, the reservoir itself does not use memristive synapses. So the synapses we use with the memristors are at the output, output uh, training node, and it is, uh, depending on the class of applications we use, linear regression. And uh, the, the randomness for the weights were generated from the CMOS circuit that we have showed there. Um, the process variations within that circuit were exploited to generate those random weights. I see, thanks. And, and the second question, uh, would be, um, what, what would be your opinion on how this, uh, this approach, the LSM approach, scales to more complex problems? Um, the, at the architecture level, the um, doubly twisted toroidal architecture, I think that was shown by several other research groups also over the last couple of days since this, it's a pretty scalable model. Um, but I think for more complex systems, there has to be slight variations of it to kind of scale um, to those systems. 